Hello everyone, my name is John Sierra and I am a Tolkien scholar, and I am the guy that you can come to with any question about J.R.R. Tolkien's works, whether it's The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, or any of his other books, his work in general, or his life. And uh, we have a lot to get to today. This is this is going to be a big one. We have 20 questions, which is the most that I've ever featured in a video, but the questions have been unusually good this past week, so it was difficult for me to pare it down uh, much further than this. And as I read a little bit to you at the beginning of the last uh, last week's video, and I had spoken about the possibility of making that a bit of a tradition, I am going to continue that tradition. And I'm going to read you a little bit, just a very brief snippet of The Children of Hurin, one of my favorite of Tolkien's books. So here we are. Thus three years passed, and in that time Turin came seldom to Thingol's halls, and he cared no longer for his looks or his attire. But his hair was unkempt, and his mail covered with a grey cloak stained with the weather. But it chanced in the third summer after Turin's departure, when he was twenty years old, that desiring rest and needing smithwork for the repair of his arms, he came, unlooked for, to Menegroth, and went one evening into the hall. <coughs> Thingol was not there, for he was abroad in the greenwood with Melian, as was his delight in times in the high summer. Turin took a seat without heed, for he was wayworn and filled with thought and by ill luck he set himself at a board amongst the elders of the realm, and in that place where Seiros was accustomed to sit. Seiros, entering late, was angered, believing that Turin had done this in pride and with intent to affront him, and his anger was not lessened to find that Turin was not rebuked by those that sat there, but was welcomed as one worthy to sit among them. For a while, therefore, Seiros feigned to be of like mind and took another seat, facing Turin across the board. Seldom does the March Warden favor us with his company, he said, and I gladly yield my accustomed seat for the chance of speech with him. But Turin, who was in converse with Mablung the Hunter, did not rise and said only a curt, I thank you. Seiros then plied him with questions concerning the news from the borders and his deeds in the wild. But though his words seemed fair, the mockery in his voice could not be mistaken. Then Turin became weary, and he looked about him, and he knew the bitterness of exile. And for all that light and laughter of the elven halls, his thought turned to Beleg, and their life in the woods, and thence far away to Morwen and Dorloman in the house of his father. And he frowned, because of the darkness of his thoughts, and made no answer to Seiros. At this, believing the frown aimed at himself, Seiros restrained his anger no longer, and he took out a golden comb and cast it on the board, before Turin crying, Doubtless, men of Hithlum, you come in haste to this table, and maybe excused your ragged cloak, but there is no need to leave your head untended as a thicket of brambles. And maybe if your ears were uncovered, you would heed better what is said to you. Turin said nothing, but turned his eyes upon Seiros, and there was a glint in their darkness. But Seiros did not heed the warning, and returned the gaze with scorn, saying for all to hear, if the men of Hithlum are so wild and fell, of what sort are the women of that land? Do they run like the deer clad only in their hair? Then Turin took up a drinking vessel and cast it in Seiros' face, and he fell backward with great hurt, and Turin drew his sword and would have run at him, but Mablung restrained him. Then Seiros, rising, spat blood upon the board and spoke as best he could with a broken mouth. How long shall we harbor this wood wolf? Who rules here tonight? The king's law is heavy upon those that hurt his lieges in the hall. And for those who draw blades, their outlawry is the least doom. Outside the hall, I could answer you, wood wolves. So, a little bit of the tension there in Menegroth between Turin and Seiros, which of course that ends badly. As does all of uh, the events of Turin's life. Uh, everything that you can say uh, about Turin's life is, and then it got worse. And then it got worse. All right, but let's get to the questions. We have a lot to get through, so let's, uh, let's start up here. Okay. Okay, so this first question is from Alice Stone, and Alice asks, do you think that Tolkien may have been neurodivergent? Um, so, you know, when you talk about things like this, I, I should, I feel like I have to give sort of a, um, a disclaimer first. I am in no way qualified to diagnose anyone. 
uh, least of all someone who died before I was born. But if you're asking for my opinion, which you clearly are, uh, my opinion is that he, he, he could have been, and I would even say that he probably was. It's easy to be a modern armchair psychiatrist and, and, and point towards uh, ASD diagnosis, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Uh, with Tolkien because he has hi he had hyperfixations, he had periods of great productivity and periods of great procrastination. He was a perfectionist. He he was known for that. Um, and you know, for a guy who dressed like an Anglo-Saxon warrior and ran at his neighbors, shrieking with an axe as a joke, he he could also at the same time be painfully shy. Um, his lectures were a lot of mumbling and stuttering. So I could also point out that he, he did live through the Somme in World War I. He had a bit of, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, I would imagine, and he could have just been full of quirks and unresolved trauma. For me, where he seems to be, you know, wired differently than most people would be his specific approach to creativity. Tolkien wrote a story called Leaf by Niggle, and it's an allegory to explain to the readers about how he doesn't use allegories. Um, it's just the kind of thing that, like, like why would you do that? If you, if you don't use allegories, why would you write an allegorical work to explain how you don't use allegories? It's, uh, it's definitely a, a very interesting way of going at things. Um, and in the Legendarium, he, he didn't start with the story, as, as almost every author would. He started with the languages. And then he worked his way backwards from language to culture, and then from culture to story. Even the ordering of his languages is interesting if you look at the little quirks in languages like Cinder and in Quenya. Um, he absolutely has the rules, and he's very consistent with the rules in his languages, but his rules tend to be something along the lines of this specific combination of letters is disallowed, because I think it sounds uncouth. So people who are neurotypical, uh, if they say they dislike automobiles, like Tolkien did, you might just not drive or drive as little as possible. Uh, but Tolkien's approach to this was to be, on purpose, terrible at driving so that he wouldn't be allowed to. Uh, he was a man of extremes at times, and often those extremes seemed to be at odds with each other. He was a shy man who loved to go out to pubs, he distrusted machines simply because he didn't like the way that they looked, and he was incredibly serious until he wasn't. So I'd say, you know, the chances of Tolkien being, um, uh, you know, let's say on the spectrum as we say, or at least some form of neurodivergence, I would say it's probably about 65%, right? 65%. Okay. Uh, moving on, I have an anonymous question here. Who were the first Noldor to come to Valinor? Um, the first Noldor to come to Valinor was Finwë, uh, who was also the first king of the Noldor. Now, he was not the founder of the Noldor, uh, or at least not the people who would become the Noldor. That would be Tata. Uh, Finwë traveled with Orome to the Undying Lands, and then he returned to Middle-earth to convince people, uh, the elves, the goodness of Amon and that they should make the great journey. The followers of Tata were originally called Tatyar, and out of the 56 Tatyar that were around there, the 56 Tatyar and uh, their uncounted uh, children, we would say, 28 of them did not follow Finwë, so they became Avari. Uh, the remainder of the Tatyar and their children followed Finwë, and they became known at that point as the Noldor. Okay, next question. Um, this one really blew my mind. It's an anonymous question, but this really... I was like, wow. Um, what should I read after The Silmarillion? I've always loved the Lord of the Rings movies, but never read any of the books. I just finished The Silmarillion, and I loved it as well. Should I go on to read The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings first? Um, I'm kind of flabbergasted, and I'm more than a little impressed here that not only did you read The Silmarillion before reading The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, um, but that you, you loved it, did it? You got through it in one shot, it sounds like, and you uh, connected with the work in a way that some people struggle to do. Even people who have read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings can struggle uh, with The Silmarillion. So 
you should be forewarned that neither of these books, The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, are anything like The Silmarillion. The Hobbit is a very breezy, light novel that you could read in a weekend. It's intended for children, so it's very, very different in its style as well. The Lord of the Rings is heavier, but it's still not like The Silmarillion. It was very detailed and descriptive, especially of scenery. It's a slower pace than The Silmarillion because The Silmarillion covers a lot of ground very quickly. It just goes through events and places and characters at a very rapid pace, uh, where The Lord of the Rings definitely does not do that. You um, are already familiar with the events of both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, not just from the films that you may have watched, but also because you read The Silmarillion. Uh, the final part of The Silmarillion, which is called um, Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, is sort of an extremely abridged uh, retelling of the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings from a different perspective. Uh, my recommendation, read The Hobbit and then read The Lord of the Rings. And then if you're wanting more, and I believe you will be, um, Unfinished Tales of Numenor and Middle-earth, that's a must. And then after that, I would say, read The Silmarillion again, because you're going to have a lot of additional context at this point, uh, a lot of additional things that you've picked up along the way. Now, no, there's just a warning that about Unfinished Tales going into this. There is a tale in there called Narn i Hindhurin, uh, which translates to The Children of Hurin, which I just read from the novel version of it. Now, you've actually already read the middle section of it. The beginning section is in Unfinished Tales, and then it, it actually tells you to go to a specific part of the Silmarillion and to read that part and then to come back, and then the ending of the story is in there. So the middle of the book is actually, you know, from the Silmarillion. Uh, if you just want to read the whole thing at once, this is the book to get right here. This is like a, this is an excellent story. You're already familiar with the, the second act of it, but not so much the first act and the third act. Um, also, um, there's also a, a, a tale in there called Of Tuar and His Coming to Gondolin, which you already know that Tuar was in Gondolin, but there's a story about how he came there, and it's a really, really good story. So, like, Unfinished Tales is sort of like a companion to the other books. Um, if you want to dive even deeper at this point, um, like the Children of Hunor, and I mentioned that, there's also Beren and Luthien, The Fall of Gondolin, The Fall of Numenor. They are novelized as well. You're familiar with the stories, but you're going to get alternate versions. You're going to get earlier drafts. You're going to get character names slightly different, and the story goes slightly differently. It's really, really interesting stuff. Um, you know, for example, Baron and Luthien uh, is a very, very old story. It predates The Hobbit, and it um, the character that we know now as Sauron was in it, but he was a cat called Tevildo, so... Yeah. Okay, moving on. Next question, also anonymous. Why does Aragorn not have the choice to be counted as an elf, even though he has elvish DNA? So, the choice to be mortal or immortal was not given to every man that has elvish ancestry. Otherwise, every single man of Numenor would have that choice. The way that it worked was descendants, specifically of Iarendil and Elwing, that had at least one immortal parent could make that choice. Now, when Iarendil and Elwing came to Aemon, uh, this was against the law of the Valar. It was also seemingly impossible, um, but they, they had a Silmaril with them, and that got them through the haze of mist and confusion that veiled Aemon against the Noldor exiles. And also, there was also the fact that they weren't really Noldor in that sense. They were, they were mortal because uh, both of them had human ancestry. And if you have elvish and human ancestry, at this point, the default is that you're mortal. So Manwe decided that they would be spared. And even though they were mortals, they did have elvish parentage. And in the case of Elwing, um, she even had ancestry of, of the Ainur because of Melian. Um, but they were never again to walk amongst the peoples of Middle-earth. They must choose mortality or immortality. Now, Yarundil actually wished to be mortal. He, he felt that he was a man, not an elf, but he chose immortality. He chose to be an elf because that's what Elwing chose, and he did not wish to be separated from her in death. Um, now, this choice would be visited on their sons, Elrond 
and Elros. Now, Elrond chose to be immortal. He chose to be an elf. And um, therefore, his children, Elrond married a woman named Calabrian. She was also an elf. So they were both elves. But they had some human ancestry that were, well, at least Elrond did. So that means that their children would also have a choice. Now, they were functionally immortal until the choice was made, and the deadline for this was when Elrond sailed west. So until the point that Elrond sailed west at the end of The Lord of the Rings, his children, Elidan, Elrohir, and Arwen, were all functionally immortal. But at that point, they had to make a choice. Now, Arwen already made her choice. She chose to be mortal. We don't know what Elidan and Elrohir chose, but they had to make a choice at that point. So Elros... Elrond's brother, he chose to be mortal. Now, we don't know his wife's name. We don't know who she was. Um, she was likely of the Adine, though, because she was mortal. Uh, so the line of Elros was what Tolkien referred to as uh, Longivus, meaning unusually long-lived. Elros had lived to be 500 years old, and his descendants would have long lives, even among the Numenorians. Um, but because Elros's children, his line, did not have an immortal parent, they were not subject to this choice. And that goes all the way down to, to Elendil and Isildur and Anarion and eventually all the way to Aragorn. So that's why Aragorn, he has a little bit of elf in him. He even has a little bit of Ainur in him, but he can't just choose to be immortal because he's of Elros's line diminished as though it was he had a long life he lived to be 210 years old but he um he was 100% mortal he could not choose to be uh immortal okay next question is Tolkien's the book of lost tales part one worth reading um it depends uh how hungry are you for Tolkien's work? Are you wishing to study his creative process? The Book of Lost Tales Part 1 is the first part of 12 volumes known as The History of Middle-Earth. So I'll list them for you. There's The Book of Lost Tales Part 1, The Book of Lost Tales Part 2, The Lays of Beleriand, The Shaping of Middle-Earth, The Lost Road and Other Writings, The Return of the Shadow, The Treason of Isengard, The War of the Ring, Sauron Defeated, Morgoth's Ring, the War of the Jewels, and the Peoples of Middle-Earth. Uh, there's also another book out there called The Nature of Middle-Earth. It's not really officially part of the history of Middle-Earth, but it sort of functions as it's as if it was a 13th part of that series. So each of these goes into Tolkien's notes and his drafts, his, his creative process, how he writes the stories, um, usually giving some very detailed writing, more detailed than you would see in the Silmarillion, especially in the Book of Lost Tales, uh, parts one and two. But these writings are of an earlier make. They're not necessarily canon to the Legendarian. Uh, the Silmarillion and its satellite stories are covered in the first five volumes. And then uh, six through nine are Lord of the Rings covered there. And then the last three, Morgoth's Ring, The War of the Jewels, and The Peoples of Middle-Earth, are more supplementary information. These ones, I would say, are canon. Um, it's just more lore and like a really deep dive of the, the minutia and the specifics of Tolkien's Legendarium. If you want more information and more context to the overall story of the Legendarium, I would actually say start with Morgoth's Ring and then go through there. Morgoth's Ring, The War of the Jewels, and The Peoples of Middle-Earth. If you want to look at the creative process and read early versions of the, the work and, and Christopher Tolkien's notes on his father's work, that's where you would say start with the Book of Lost Tales, part one, and go from there. Um, also, you may notice that um, the history of Middle-earth, it covers the Silmarillion and it covers the Lord of the Rings. It does not cover the Hobbit. There was actually two separate volumes that covered all the the writing process and the, the early versions of The Hobbit. Uh, the first one was called Mr. Baggins, and the second one was called Return to Bag End. Though there is a one-volume version, which is just called The History of the Hobbit, so if you're interested, that's that exists as well. Okay. Uh, next question. Did Glorfindel ever marry? Uh, don't know. It's a question. There's no answer to it. Um, as Glorfindel is not a very fleshed out character in Tolkien's work. Glorfindel was a somewhat important elf. He was head of the House of the Golden Flower in Gondolin. 
Um, but if he had a wife or if he had children, they were never mentioned. I'm not saying that he definitely was not married or that he definitely didn't have any children. Um, he could have. We just don't know the answer to that. Glorfindel uh, died after the fall of Gondolin. He stabbed a Balrog in the stomach with his dagger. It, As it fell, it grabbed him by the hair, dragged him down into an abyss with it. Um, after his body in Middle-earth would, would wither away and to nothing, then he was able to receive a new body and come out of Mandos, after which he lived in Amon until he was sent to Middle-earth during the Second Age to assist Elrond uh, in his defense against Sauron. It's possible that he may have been sent at the same time as uh, the wizards, particularly the blue wizards. After assisting Frodo in Book 1 and a few lines of dialogue at the Council of Elrond in Book 2 of The Lord of the Rings, Glorfindel isn't mentioned again, um, so we have no information on what is his family structure, uh, if he ever sailed west. It's, it's notable that the Gildor is another elf from the Lord of the Rings. That you know He was said to be at Mithlond at the end, uh, but not Glorfindel. So, and you know, Gildor is a much more minor character than Glorfindel, so it's kind of interesting. We don't know if he sailed west even uh, after the, you know, his second time. Okay, next question. Also anonymous, why did Sauron prefer an intimidating physical form over a beautiful, deceptive one? Um, Sauron absolutely prefers a beautiful, deceptive form. Um, there's a Java update available. I'm sorry about that. His most successful ventures have been using forms like that. His most successful fair form was Anatar, uh, which he used to trick the elves of Eregion into creating rings of power. Another very successful form was Zigor, which he appeared as in Numenor, and he seduced the last king of Numenor, Afarazan the Golden, into attacking Amon. And that, of course, led to the Calabeth. Um, this venture was, was very successful to him. Uh, it destroyed Numenor, though many of the Dúnedain did survive because they were, they were on Middle-earth or they were near Middle-earth at the time. Um, but the Calabeth also, even though it was like a win for Sauron, it also severely damaged him. It destroyed his body. He was able to put himself back together again, but uh, from then on, he could no longer take a fair form. So in the latter part of the Second Age and on into the Third Age, uh, Sauron took on a terrible form because he could no longer appear beautiful. Okay, next question. Um, were all animals formerly immortal before the birth of mankind? Uh, so this is something that Tolkien ever mentioned, and I think it's an odd assumption to make. But, um, hold on, this has lyrics and that always throws me off. Let me just skip to the next song. Oh, that's... There we go. So, yeah, I, I think it's an odd assumption to make that animals were immortal until the birth of man. Um, we can only really come to the conclusion from the text that no animals in Tolkien's world were immortal. Um, at least not it, like immortal in the way that elves are immortal. Um, now, it's not stated by Tolkien... But it was believed that some animals, such as Huan, the Hound of Valinor, and, and uh, some of the earliest of the eagles, might have been Ainur, uh, specifically Maya. So if this is true, they're not really animals, but they're Ainur choosing the form of a... I thought I skipped to a song without lyrics. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. It's just, it throws me off when I'm talking and there's like lyrics in the background. Okay, so they wouldn't really be animals then. They're, they're Maya, who, they would be Maya if that took the form of an animal or incarnated as an animal. Um, and it is true that in the early drafts of the story, Juan specifically was a Maya, uh, though later it was changed to he was just an unusually large and unusually long-lived dog who was prophesied to only die in battle with the greatest werewolf, which is th exactly what happened. So the key thing, though, is that unlike the elves who can return after some time, Juan did not return. Also, some creatures that appear animalistic are not really animals, such as Ungoliant. Ungoliant took the form of a spider, but she wasn't a spider, she was a spirit. Uh, one thing that's interesting is there are some creatures that might be close to being immortal. You know, they're just so long-lived 
that they might be, you know, very close to being immortal. The eagles are an example of this. Now, Thorandor was the Lord of the Eagles in the Silmarillion, and he's actually never mentioned again after the War of Wrath. We might come to the conclusion that he may have died during the War of Wrath, but we don't actually know it. His death wasn't mentioned. Um, but Gwaihir was his son and a vassal of Thorandor, and he was around in the First Age, and then he was still around in the Third Age. It's possible that the eagles might be something like the Ents. They're not immortal, but they're extremely long-lived. Now, orcs may have been animals at one point, at least according to Tolkien's very late writings. Um, they were made in mockery of elves, that we cannot deny. But were they made from elves? In the text, we're led to believe that they were made from elves. That was one theory that was um, posited about the nature of the orcs. But later on, Tolkien had the idea that they were simple animals that Morgoth imbued with size and intelligence to mock the elves. Um, regardless, it we don't know the lifespan of orcs, believe it or not. Um, they usually die violently, but we don't ever hear of how long an orc can live, you know. And that, like I said, that's assuming they even are animals in that sense. Uh, Shelob. Shelob was also very old. Uh, she's from the First Age as well. Um, actually, probably a little older than the First Age. But considering who her mother was, it's likely that that's what contributed to her long life. She wasn't actually immortal, so... There certainly are examples of extremely long-lived animals in Tolkien's world, but true immortality was granted only to the Ainur and to the firstborn children of Iluvatar, the elves. Okay, next question. Why did only Rohan and Gondor participate in the wars against Sauron and no other kingdom like Eriador? Um, Rohan and Gondor certainly were not the only participants in the war. Uh, and Eriador is not so much a kingdom at that point, it's a region, and it contains many lands, and one of them is Arnor, um, which didn't have a king. Aragorn was the king of Arnor, but he, he had to assume that throne, and that happened after the War of the Ring. We largely hear of the events in the south, Gondor, Rohan, and the reason is because this is where the chief heroes are. This, you know, Sauron's forces were attacking the north as well, though. Um, his forces were coming from the east, from a land called Rune, and this war included Dale, Esgroth, Erebor, Mirkwood, and Lothlorien. They were victorious, but they did have some heavy casualties. Uh, Dane the Second, Ironfoot, who was king under the mountain of Erebor, he passed, and King Brand of Dale also passed. So these other battles were very important. Sauron's reach was far beyond just Mordor, Harad, and Khand, which are in the south, but also Rune. And Rune may have overwhelmed the north with Easterlings, uh, and they may have slain and raised their way across Rovanian and over the Misty Mountains and into Eriador, but of course that didn't happen. Uh, the goal, of course, was to drive the elves further and further west and finally drive them into the sea and out of Middle-earth. Okay. All right, next question. And this is, this is the one from the, uh, from the thumbnail. How does Gandalf call the Great Eagles? Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't ever call the Eagles. He can't do that. That's not uh, an ability that he has. He doesn't summon them. Every time the Great Eagles show up, it's either an opportunistic attack by them, they're attacking orcs, or uh, they're doing someone a favor. In The Hobbit, they show up to attack some orcs that have wandered very close to their territory. Now, the orcs and the eagles are very ancient enemies, and the eagles will eradicate them on sight. Um, they'll even travel to attack them if there is a rumor of orcs. That's, of course, what happens at the Battle of Five Armies. Now, they did bear Gandalf, Bilbo, and the dwarves slightly along the road there. Uh, Gandalf was calling in a favor. Um, now, it's hinted that Gwaihir owed him one that Gandalf had done something for Gwaihir in the past and that, you know, he was owed a favor and this was the one and only time that Gandalf called in a favor to the eagles. Now, he didn't call them, 
they showed up because of the orcs, but he basically said, you owe me one, and Greyhair was like, yeah, I do, and so he, uh, he helped him out in that instance. Now, when, in The Lord of the Rings, when Greyhair shows up and rescues Gandalf at Isengard, uh, he was doing a favor, but this time it was for Radagast the Brown. Uh, Radagast was a friend of the eagles because he's a friend of all birds, all animals, and he asked Greyhair, begged him even, to check on Gandalf and Saruman. Uh, so Greyhair came to Isengard at Radagast's behest, and he saw Gandalf stranded on the top of the tower at Orthanc, and he rescued him. Now, he made it very clear that he was not going to bear him very far. He complained that Gandalf was very heavy, and he could not bear him all the way to a place such as Imladris or Lothlorien. But Gandalf, he understood this, and he just merely asked to be set down in Rohan, which was very near, very nearby. So, then Gwaihir comes and rescues Gandalf again, this time at the peak of Ziroxigil. So Gandalf was just starting to become conscious. He had just returned to life. He had died. He, it was 20 days later he was coming back to life. This rescue was another favor, but this time it was for Galadriel. So Gwaihir remarked that Gandalf was lighter than he was previously. Uh, he did not have Gandalf, who could barely move at this point, climb onto his back, but he scooped him up in his claws and carried him away that way, which was very frightening for Gandalf, by the way. And that was to Lothlorien, once again from Ziroxigil to Lothlorien, a very short distance. So, so far we've only seen Gwaihir take Gandalf, or other eagles take characters, you know, such as the dwarves and Bilbo in, you know, in The Hobbit, very short distances. So the last time, the eagles showed up at Moranon, which is the Black Gate of Mordor. Uh, now this is pretty far out of the way for them, even to attack orcs, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Gandalf asks here after the battle to bear him to Mordor, into Mordor, to go to Orodred to rescue Frodo and Sam, who had destroyed the ring. This is where it gets interesting. So Gandalf assures Gwaihir that he will not be as heavy a burden as he had been in the past, but Gwaihir's response is very interesting. He states that he will bear Gandalf wherever he wants to go, no matter how heavy he is, even if he were made out of stone. Uh, so he takes Gandalf to Orodrin and back with the other two eagles that Gandalf asked for. He did ask for three eagles. Took Frodo and Sam. There was not a third eagle for Gollum, and that's a kind of a meme from the film version, because three eagles go, but um, one takes Sam, and then uh, Gandalf kind of scoops Frodo up onto Gwaihir with him, and the third eagle is just sort of chilling. Um, so why is there a big change of attitude in the character of Gwaihir? He's gone from, you're heavy, and this isn't my job, I won't take you very far, and he's gone all the way over to, I will take you wherever you want to go, no matter how heavy you are, even if you were a stone statue. So I believe that this final act was also a, a favor of a sort, at least. But this time, it was for the one being that Gwaihir would deem to be his master, who can summon him, and that would be Manwe. So Manwe is the king of Arda. He is the lord of all birds, and his presence is unseen but felt in the climax of the War of the Ring because he's also known as the Lord of the Breath of Arda, and it was indeed a wind, the breath of Arda, that blew Sauron away after the ring was destroyed and Sauron made one last desperate attack towards Aragorn and Gandalf. Now, shortly after this, his Lord of the Eagles, son of Thorondor, tells Gandalf that he will take him wherever he wants to go. So Gandalf never summons the eagles. He can call in a favor. Other people can too, if they are friends of eagles and are owed a favor, perhaps. Um, but in the end, Gwaihir's words seem to suggest that he is honor-bound to bear Gandalf in this instance, and only Manwe could put him in that sort of position. Okay, next question. Was sailing the skies forever a punishment for Yarendil? Uh, no, certainly not. We, we actually just talked a little bit about Yarendil and Elwing, who sailed west. Uh, and it was decided pretty much as soon as they got there uh, that the only punishment that they would receive was that they would never again walk amongst the elves or men of Middle-earth. Um, 
They both had to, of course, as I mentioned, choose mortality or immortality. And of course, we know that Yarendil wanted mortality, but he chose immortality because that's what Elwing chose. The only punishment was that that condition. They couldn't go back to Middle-earth and walk amongst the people. Now, he, Yarendil actually did return to Middle-earth to fight in the War of Wrath, but he stayed in his flying ship so and, and slew Ankalagan the Black. So uh, we can say that he didn't in that case, walk amongst men or elves, he was in his flying ship, slaying dragons. Uh, Tolkien doesn't get into the exact reason that, though he lived in Valinor, Yarendil took his ship to the skies with the Silmaril, but it could be a variety of reasons. For one, um, he is said to guard the doors of night, and this is certainly something that any Maya could do. Um... But it just may be that Yarendil is a mariner at heart. He he wants to be in his ship, and Elwing could not come on his journeys because she could not bear the cold of um, of Ilmen. But the Valar gave her wings and and a tower so that she could fly by Yarendil when he came near. And of course, they they did spend time together. He did not spend all of the time in the sky. Now, I believe, though, that Yarendil sails in the sky as a star with the Silmaril so that his kin in Middle-earth can look up and see the light of the Silmaril and know he's there. He made a major sacrifice. He would not be reunited with his children, um, Elros and Elrond. Never with Elros, and certainly not with Elrond until the Fourth Age, when Elrond sailed west. So... He could never see one child again, and the other he would not see for a very long time. Um, he never got to meet his granddaughter, either Arwen. Um, so, you know, they could always just look up in the sky and see the light and know that that's him. So I think that's why he's up there. I don't think it's anything to do with the punishment. Okay, next question. All right. Uh, this one was asked by the Oski Boski. It's, it's sort of, sort of a doozy because it's such a simple and kind of silly question, but it's also uh, really fun to talk about. Did Melkor sing dark rock or heavy metal in the Ainu Lindale? Uh, it's funny to talk about. I don't personally care for the idea of rock or metal being associated with evil, but the truth is, we're not told exactly what the music of the Ainu sounded like. We're not given any sort of clue to the genre. I mean, we're given clues, but we're not told directly what it would sound like. There's oblique hints in the text, and there weren't any instruments, only voices, but the, the voices of the Ainur sounded like instruments, at least according to Bilbo's translated text of the ancient Elvish lore. And I'm going to read you a portion from Ainu Lindale. Uh, and it came to pass that Iluvatar called together all the Ainur, and declared to them a mighty theme, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed, and the glory of his beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Iluvatar and were silent. Then Iluvatar said to them, Of the theme that I have declared to you, I will know that ye make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled with you the flame... Uh, I'm sorry, let me read that part again. And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, ye shall now... I keep screwing up. Ye shall show forth your powers in adorning his theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. But I will sit and hearken and be glad that though you... Though you through you, great beauty has been wakened into song. Then the voices of the Ainur, like unto harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and viols and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Iluvatar to a great music. And a sound arose of endless, interchanging melodies woven in harmony that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwelling of Iluvatar were filled to overflowing, and the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was not void. Never since have the Ainur made any music like to this music, though it has been said that a greater still shall be made before Iluvatar by the choirs of the Ainur and the children of Iluvatar after the end of days. Then the themes of Iluvatar shall be played aright, and take being into moment 
of their utterance, for all shall then understand fully his intent in their part, and shall show the comprehension of each, and Iluvatar shall give their thoughts the secret fire, being well pleased. So, I don't think that Tolkien would have seen any part of the Ainu Lindale as being uh, pop music of any sort, mostly because he didn't personally care for popular music. He referred to rock, for example, as Beatle groups that was on a long list of types of music that he did not care for. Judging from the text, we can see that the Ainu Lindale was probably symphonic in nature. Uh, we get the whole idea of the mighty theme, and from this we can likely uh, defer it being a classical structure. A theme or a subject is the focal melody. We can we can infer from this that the Ainu Lindale was improvised by the Ainu based on a melody wrought by Iluvatar as sort of a call and response. First, Iluvatar would hum out a bit of music, and then the Ainur would build upon it with their own thoughts, all putting their own melodies and harmonies into it, but all of them would follow Iluvatar's theme, his structure, or they would harmonize with his theme, and it would work together. Um, it, it was a mighty theme, which suggests that it was probably bombastic and loud, but it was not what we would call heavy in terms of, of uh, heavy metal. The voices of the Ainur were said to be like instruments. The ones they mentioned, harps, lutes, pipes, trumpets, fields, it suggests that they would be organs, plucked strings, brass. You, you might sort of guess from this that it would sound rather Baroque. Now, let's talk about Melkor. I'm going to read you another sample of Ainur Lindale. But now Iluvatar sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Iluvatar. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. To Melkor among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone into the void places, seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own. And it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Yet he found not the fire, for it is with Iluvatar. But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own unlike those of his brethren. Some of these thoughts he now wove into his music, and straightway discord arose about him, and many that sang nigh him grew despondent, and their thought was disturbed, and their music faltered, but some began to attune their music their music to rather than the thought which they had at first. Then the discord of Melkor spread ever wider, and the melodies which had been heard before foundered in a sea of turbulent sound. But Iluvatar sat and hearkened until it seemed that about his throne there was a raging storm, as of dark waters that made war upon one another in an endless wrath that would not be assuaged. So here we see that Melkor was initially going along with it and doing what everyone else was doing, but then he had the idea that he's the greatest in might, so his thoughts should dominate the music, and he began themes that were discordant, meaning that they clashed with Iluvatar's themes. This does not necessarily mean that it was a different genre of music, but rather a different song. And Melkor's theme was said to be catchy enough that some of the Ainur around him were swept up by it. Iluvatar would answer with still more powerful themes, and they basically had a loudness war until Iluvatar declared it to be over. Melkor's music isn't greatly described other than that it was violent, and from this I might infer that he may have been singing something that would be akin to a Wagner opera. It's still in the same basic genre of music, of classical music, as the other Ainur, but clashing in a non-compatible way. And in this sense, it actually makes perfect sense for Tolkien to think of it that way, if he in fact did, because he did not like Wagner's operas. So the thought of Melkor whipping out a flying V guitar and, and shredding out, you know, Children of the Grave by Black Sabbath, it's funny, it's amusing, but it's not something that the author would have intended, especially since the text of it, it the, the Silmarillion may have been released in the 70s, but the text of it is much older than that, and a lot of it, a lot of the writing probably predated the prevalence of rock music. Okay, next question, and this one was submitted by Connor C., 
who asks, after Sauron's defeat in the end of the Third Age, could there have been another Dark Lord or Lady of near equal power to arise in the Fourth Age? If yes, then who is the best possible candidate? Uh, there's always room for another evil, though I don't think that another Dark Lord or a Dark Lady, as it were, would have approached anything like Sauron's power or influence. The reason I say this is because if you look at the way that the Lord of the Rings ended, we have the departure of some key figures, Gandalf, Galadriel, Elrond. Um, Gandalf's departure is really interesting. It's not the only significant thing about him, though, at the end of the story. He also had declined to enter the Shire towards the end of the story. There was no doubt that Gandalf was well aware of what Saruman had done in the Shire, and he even basically told the hobbits what they were in for. But he declined to go with them. Instead, he traveled to the Old Forest to have what he called a long overdue conversation with Tom Bombadil. So Sauron was the last great evil of the world. Um, this didn't mean that there was any more, that, that, that evil was gone. There was still evil, but they were petty evils. Saruman had become a petty evil. Perhaps at one point he could have become a great dark lord in his own right before he was relieved of his station by Gandalf the White, but the time for that had passed. Gandalf had all the most important elves going with him when he left, um, because Sauron was gone, and they could safely leave Middle-earth in the hands of men, who were capable of dealing with petty evils that would arise. In uh, Tolkien had a proposed sequel to The Lord of the Rings uh, called The New Shadow, and uh, it, it involved an orc-worshipping cult. Uh, it's not a very long story. He didn't get very far into it before abandoning it, but it dealt with this cult who, that worshipped orcs arising, and I'm sure that there was probably going to be some sort of key figure behind it. I mean, maybe a lot of people like to say it could have been one of the missing blue wizards had gone bad. Um, more likely to me, it would have been something like the Mouth of Sauron or or the unseen lieutenant of Morgul, Gothmog. Um, either way, Tolkien knew that there wouldn't, was not going to be another Sauron in the Fourth Age, and he found the story of the New Shadow to be mundane and depressing, so he didn't continue it. He abandoned it in the early stages. Okay. Uh, next question. Why couldn't Ulmo simply recover Maglor's Silmaril from the sea like he did to Elwing's one? Um, eventually, someone's going to retrieve it. In the Prophecy of Dagor Degaroth, which is incomplete and only obliquely referenced in the Silmarillion, which is also incomplete, there are several mentions of the Silmarils returning. In one text, it's mentioned that um, a discovery of what material they are made from, Salima, will be made after the final battle and the return of Feanor. In another, it's mentioned that they will be reunited from earth, sea, and sky, and broken open to revive the two trees. The character mentioned to do this is named Maedros, which is an early version of Maedros, um, and uh, the one to rekindle the trees was called Belaurun, which is an early version of Yavanna. Uh, there was a more refined version that came a bit later. It was suggested that Feanor himself would retrieve the Silmarils from the sea and the land, and the Arendil would just surrender his. And Feanor simply gives them to Yavanna. She breaks them open and revives the trees. And then Tolkien changed his mind, saying that Feanor would be the one to break them open for Yavanna. So at one point, Tolkien did plan to have these Silmarils found and recovered, but Ulmo is not mentioned in any of these ideas. Um, and to answer the more direct question as to why Ulmo doesn't just pluck the Silmaril out of the water, I believe the term you're looking for is needle in a haystack, or perhaps more appropriately, a drop of water in an ocean. Uh, the Silmaril's you know, tiny compared to the Balagir Sea. It would be very, very difficult for even Ulmo to find. It's not like he has like a you know, his, his spider senses are tingling when he's near a Silmarillion, a Silmarillion. It doesn't work like that. So, um, and Olmo is also really, really smart. He's probably the smartest of the Valar, at least in my opinion. He has the greatest foresight, I think. And I don't think he would even attempt to find the Silmaril. Why would he? Um, it seemed like they needed all three Silmarils to revive the two trees, and only Feanor was going to be able to break them open anyway. And uh, the gems had already done enough damage in, in Middle-earth, so there was no reason for Olmo to do that, even if he could find them. Okay, next question. This one's from Aido, who asks, Do we know what Sauron's original form was, or was it just an invisible spirit? Uh, Sauron's original form, like all of the Ainur, was a spirit, and it would be invisible to the children of Iluvatar. 
Um, he was called Myron back then, and he would have been a spirit like any other Ainur. Uh, though after the Ainur Lindale and seeing the vision of Ea, he would have taken shape and hue. Uh, a fair form akin to the children of Iluvatar. Now, Myron's physical appearance has never been described, but most artists seem to enjoy depicting him as a red-headed elf man. All of the Ainur can shift their form. Sauron took this to a whole nother level. He became known as a shapeshifter. He could be uh, uh, any number of fair forms. He could also be a wolf, a snake, a vampire, a great dark lord. He had others. But his original form, as you say, it would have been invisible. Okay. Next question. Why were there only nine ring wraiths? Uh, because Sauron had nine rings to give to the men. Uh, Sauron recovered... 16 rings of power from Eregion. Three of them remained hidden and kept safe by the elves. And he gave seven to the Dwarf Lords, which was an appropriate number for the dwarves because there were seven houses of the Khazad. It didn't really work out for him. The, the rings barely affected the dwarves. The, there was some minor corruption, but he couldn't control them. He failed to account for the fact that dwarves are not children of Iluvatar, at least not yet. Uh, though he would later recover three of the seven that he gave to the dwarves, the other four uh, being destroyed by dragons, this was until later. Uh, he didn't have the one ring at that point, so he couldn't create more wraiths. So that left, leaves him with nine rings to give to men, and specifically targeted wicked men who were tyrants and bullies. Now, we know that there was at least one Easterling Lord and three Black Numenorians included in this, but we don't really know who any of them were, other than one of them, the Easterling, was named Kamul. So, after his return, he did take the Nine Rings back from the Nazgul, because they were already fully bound to him. Um, and he had three rings that he had recovered from the dwarves. So he had twelve rings of power, and theoretically, if he had the one ring, he could then create twelve more Nazgul, but he didn't have the one ring, so that's why. Okay, next question. Uh, who was the mother of Legolas? I have tried to go into some research, but the answer always comes back to Galadriel, even though his mother had died. Uh, well, whoever said anything about Galadriel being related to Legolas, that's that's probably a joke. Uh, they're not related. And uh, there's no indication that Legolas' mother died, actually. So Legolas' mother is an unnamed elf. She... Uh, they, we never learn her name. She's not mentioned or alluded to in any of Tolkien's books or writings, other than by the simple fact that Legolas, of course, must have had a mother. Um, so Thranduil and Legolas are Sindar elves, and it's likely that their unseen mother was either also Sindar or perhaps a Sylvan elf. Now, we don't know if she had died or if she had sailed west at some point or if she was just present but unseen during The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, we just don't know anything about her. Um, and that seems to be fairly typical for Mirkwood elves. I mean, they don't have complex genealogies. They don't keep track of these things. And we certainly never learn uh, Thranduil's wife's name or, or his mother's name even. So it's just not a thing that we know. Uh, Galadriel is not related to Legolas. Uh, her only child, as far as we know, is Cal Calabrian. Uh, who was Elrond's wife, and uh, there were some early drafts that where Galadriel had a second son named Amroth, a second son, a second child who was a son named Amroth, but um, but that's it. Uh, not, certainly not Legolas. Uh, Galadriel is a Noldo, a Noldor elf, and she's not related in any way to Legolas. Okay. Hold on one second. I was just reading the comments here because... Okay. Some of the comments. <laughs> These two people got into an argument. I, I wasn't aware of it until just now. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Next question. Why did the elves of Regian let Anatar in, especially considering recent events? So Sauron was Anatar, and he knew exactly what to say. He had already been rejected by Lindon, which might have actually been part of his plan. When Sauron came to Eregion in his guise as Anatar, he was upfront about having already approached Lindon and having been rejected. He lamented the weakness of the strong and how powerful Gilgalad and wise Elrond had rejected him. This seems 
to the seduction novice, so to say, to be perhaps counterproductive. Why would he advertise his failure? But then Sauron goes on to speculate out loud as to why he had been rejected, wondering aloud perhaps that Gilgalad and Elrond did not wish to share in the splendor of their realm with the rest of Middle-earth. Sauron posits himself as a lover of Middle-earth who wants to make it as lovely as Eresea or, or even Valinor. And he frames Gilgalad and Elrond as jealous, uh, who wish to keep the majesty locked away in Lindon, uh, not sharing it with the other realms of Middle-earth. Beyond this, Sauron also puts compliments into his manipulation. He states that the elves of Regin clearly love Middle-earth as much as he does, because they could have returned to Amon and they chose not to. Um, so why not use his talents and the things that he has to teach them to make Middle-earth every bit as majestic and wonderful as Amon? So, I'm sorry. I just skipped way ahead. It's just ridiculous. There's so many songs. I didn't know. I'm not probably not going to use this playlist again. So, he basically tells them Lindon missed out on a great deal, and now they can get in on the ground floor on turning Middle-earth into a paradise with these rings of power. It makes Oregon feel like they're in competition with the other elvish realm, and they jump at the opportunity to, to get in on this, and of course that, that's Anatar's grand design. The other elves had not seen the wisdom of it. So actually getting rejected like that actually helped matters. And Sauron was very smart. He knew how to uh, worm his way in. Okay, two more questions. This one says, is Treebeard older than the ring? Yes, not only yes, but he's a lot older than the ring. So the One Ring was created by Sauron in the Second Age. Treebeard makes reference to events of the First Age when he speaks to Merry and Pippin. He talks about walking in the lands that are now under the waves. That's Beleriand, which only existed prior to the Second Age and in the First Age. So it's reasonable, though, to believe that Treebeard's actually a lot older than even the First Age. Um, the Ents came about around the same time as the Dwarves. Before even the Elves awakened in Middle-earth, um, Aule created the Dwarves, and his wife, Yavanna, she was worried about what that entailed, and that the Dwarves were just going to go around chopping up all her trees. So she asked Manwe if he could intervene in some way, and uh, Manwe prayed on it, and then he concluded that during the music of the Ainur, the Ainur Lindale, Yvanna had put her thought into it and that she had already created a race that would protect the trees, the shepherds of the trees, which we call Ents. So Tremir is called the eldest by Celeborn at the end of The Lord of the Rings. It suggests that he might be the oldest of all the Ents, and he walked Middle-earth before even the elves had awakened. So to put that in perspective, he's older than the War of the Valar, he's older than the Great Journey of the Elves, he's older than the Two Trees of Valinor. Okay, final question. Where does Gandalf come from? Uh, Gandalf comes from the Void. Gandalf's true name is Olorin, and he is an Ainu, basically an angel. That's Tolkien's version of an angel. The Ainur were the first things that were created by Eru Iluvatar in the Void, and with all of the others, he dwelled outside of time and space in a place called the Timeless Halls. Now, when Ea, which is the universe, and Arda, which is the world, were created, a great number of the Ainur descended to dwell there, then they became bound to Arda, and Olorin was of their number. The greatest and most fair of the Ainur that descended to Arda were called the Valar, which means the powers, and the rest of them were called the Maya, which are called the beautiful. Uh, Olorin is a Maya. So originally he would have dwelled in Middle-earth during the spring of Arda, but the land was marred by Melkor, and as the Valar fought Melkar, Olorin was one of the guardians that protected the elves from the destructive forces of the battle. After the war, all of the Ainur removed themselves from Middle-earth to Aman, which was the uttermost west portion of Arda. So there, Olorin walked unseen among the elves. He gave them fair visions and dreams and wisdom, but he uh, sometimes did appear as visible, but he disguised himself as an elf. So upon returning to Middle-earth, Olorin was now an incarnate, an Istari 
which means wizard, he was bound to a real body with limited powers and memories. His form was of an older man. Now, he wasn't as old as he was later, but he aged very slowly, and by the observations of Círdan, he seemed to be physically the oldest and spiritually the wisest of the five chiefs of the Astari. So, Aloran became a great friend to all the races of Middle-earth, and the elves called him Mithrandir, the men of Harad called him Encanus, the dwarves called him Thorkun, and the men of the north and, and the hobbits called him Gandalf, which is the name that he preferred the most and the name that he usually introduced himself as. So Gandalf eventually did return to Amon at the end of the Third Age. So, there we have it. I got 20 questions and a reading in in just, just over an hour, so I'm, I'm happy about that. I will see you guys next time. Like the video, comment on the video, share the video, subscribe to me if you haven't, and ask me some questions. We'll see you guys next week.